The Bible is like a compass and an anchor, so thanks for leaning in as we grow together. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, howdy, Faith Church. Good to see you all this morning. We've been working our way through Jesus' most famous teaching, the Sermon on on the mount, and I am so grateful as I talk with a bunch of you, as I interact throughout election season, how much I see us as a family trying to lean into God's teaching and learn and grow, even when it's hard or challenging, so that we're representing Christ well, even in the midst of trying circumstances. Kind of want to go back to the beginning when we started in September 8th talking about the Sermon on the Mount. There were two things I brought up then that I kind of want to resurface with us again today. These two things, this quote from Sinclair Ferguson where he said, the Sermon on the Mount is, it's not about a sermon about an ideal life in an ideal world, but about a kingdom life in a fallen world. Have you noticed our world is difficult? Jesus is a realist, right? He, he's not trying to teach us something or challenge us to something that he's not kind of dealing with in a very honest, very real, realistic world, that this is a fallen world, right? And so this isn't Christian platitudes and an easy life, no. Man, you might walk in today and you might be on top of the world with the election results. You might feel devastated about the re- election results. And Jesus wants us, no matter where we are and what circumstances we find ourselves in, to live in a way that represents his kingdom despite ideal circumstances. We find ourselves all the time in less than ideal circumstances. I also encourage you as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, that the Sermon on the Mount is more than a mirror, it's an MRI, right? So when Jesus teaches us this way, when he leads us through this sermon, he wants us to see ourselves so that we can actually become the best version of ourselves. He isn't lifting up this teaching to show us something that we can't attain to or something that we can't deal with. No, he's holding up something that we can attain to and we can see ourselves and change and be different, but it's more than just outside behavioral modification. It's inside. It's an MRI where you begin to see yourself on the inside, see who you are and what you're like because he cares about our attitudes and actions being aligned completely with him. And so I wonder, as we've worked through the Sermon on the Mount together as a community, if you would call yourself a Christ follower today, if you would say, I've put my trust and hope in Jesus Christ today, as we've marched through this very famous teaching of Jesus, what have you noticed about yourself, Christ follower? I'm not talking to you if you're curious about Jesus. I'm so glad you're here. I'm not talking to you if you admire Jesus I'm so glad you're here. I'm talking to you if you're someone who would say, I'm a child of Almighty God. I have put my trust in Jesus. What has Christ shown you in the mirror of his word this fall or the MRI of your insides that you can look at yourself and go, man, I have work to do in this area. I have work to do in this area. With the Spirit's help, he will help you see and change, become the best version of you, but you actually have to look at the MRI in the mirror and go, I see what you're diagnosing, Dr. Jesus, and I want to be different. I want to change. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you for your word that's alive and active, for your son Jesus that that brought us into your family because of his life and death and resurrection. I thank you for the Sermon on the Mount that diagnoses the inside of us, that shows us and exposes the inside and the outside. Father, today, for those who call themselves Christ followers, what's one thing from the Sermon on the Mount? 
It's one thing from your teaching, one thing from your word that we can work on with your help. You expose this so that we can deal with it and grow and change, and your spirit will help us grow and change. So would you help us? Your sons and daughters want to represent you well on planet Earth. We want to represent you well. So as we continue looking at this last chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, may we see ourselves in the mirror and may we not look away at the MRI that we might become like you. In Christ's name, amen. If you have your Bibles, we're in Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, which is built on Matthew chapter 6, which is built on Matthew chapter 5. And so when we worked our way through Matthew chapter 5, we learned who we are in Christ, that when we put our hope and trust in Jesus Christ, he changes us. The old is gone, the new is come. And now as followers of Christ, I'm to be poor in spirit. I'm to be hungering and thirsting after righteousness. I'm to be meek. I'm to be merciful. I'm to be a peacemaker. I'm to be pure in heart. I will be persecuted and I'm called to be salt and light. That's the first half of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, second half through Matthew chapter 6 is about how our life changes that in light of who I am as a follower of Christ, What I do and how I do it matters, and Jesus teaches us that. When he gets to Matthew chapter 7, he's going to zone in on three specific things. Matthew chapter 7 is sort of broken up into these three categories, how we interact with people. He's going to finalize this section of his sermon going, I want to teach you how to interact with people, verses 1 through 6, how to interact with God, verses 7 through 12, and then I'm going to call you to make a decision. I'm going to call you to make a decision about everything I've said and everything I am. And throughout Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he's calling us to decision, to people to make a decision, right? He's, he's like, you, you're going to serve a master. It's either going to be God or money. You decide. You're going, to, you're going to be concerned about your body or your clothes or what you wear or what you eat, or you're going to seek first my kingdom and my righteousness and all these things will be added to you. You, you decide. You're going to have to make a decision, and sometimes as followers or people in general, we don't like having to make a decision, but Jesus leaves nothing neutral, and the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount requires us to make decisions about whether we believe what Jesus is saying is true or not true. So today, there's decisions to make. There's decisions to make. Matthew chapter 7, we're going to jump into verse 1, into the section about how to interact with people. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, he starts out and says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, you Broadway, you makeup, you mask. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Verse 6, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Jesus is talking about how we interact with people. And he starts out by saying, do not judge, which we all go, yes, Jesus. Like, we're with you. Like, someone judging me, being judgmental, right? Sort of the diagnosis of the church of Jesus Christ today. People will say this all the time. Christianity is so judgmental, right? We're like, yeah, Jesus, We shouldn't judge, but is that what he's really saying? Does it mean that we're not supposed to see? We're not supposed to make decisions about what we see? Does it mean we close our eyes and look the other way? Is that what he's talking about? To judge means to look with a critical eye, to look with a fault-finding eye, to look with a harshness that sees someone else's mistakes and misses seeing your own. He says... Don't close your eyes. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about how you interact with other people and when you see certain things, how you respond to it, what you do with what you see. And that's why he continues. He says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? I mean, if we're not supposed to look around, why would he even talk about this whole speck thing? And 
wood thing, right? He's like, he knows you're going to look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye. Why would you do that and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Like he's, he's showing us that we're supposed to use good judgment, right? We should use judgment, but he's prioritizing how we see things. He says, you hypocrite, remember? Broadway, drama, costume, makeups. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brothers. First, he's reordering, prioritizing how we see things. First, look at the plank in your own eye, then, right? So it's do this first and this second. Have you gotten a speck of dust in your eye before? Is it irritating? Is it possible that if you rub the speck too much, it will hurt you and take away? Having a speck of dust in your eye is a problem. Jesus is not saying, don't take the speck out of your brother or sister's eye. No. He's saying, look at yourself first. Take the plank out of your eye first, and then with the gentleness and the precision of an eye surgeon, help your brother or sister because there's something in their eye that's going to hurt them or harm them. And from Jesus' teaching, I kind of see something in myself, maybe you've seen it in yourself too, that I find myself generous with myself and hard on others. This is Joe's natural disposition, right? When it comes to looking around, when I look at myself, I look very kindly at myself, very patiently with myself, very merciful with myself, very slow to anger with myself. I'm very generous with myself, and I want you to be generous with me too, but I'm very hard, critical, fault-finding, harsh with other people. And Jesus is saying in his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, not so with my sons and daughters. No, it's the reverse. He's saying that's the old and that's gone. That no longer exists. This is now how you are to live. I am to be hard on myself, precise on myself, and generous with other people. Not self-condemning. Don't beat yourself up. That's not what Jesus is saying. But he's saying take a hard MRI and Look at yourself clearly in the mirror and do the hard work of studying yourself before you would ever look at someone else, before you would ever with precision try to help someone see something in them. You're no eye surgeon if you can't first do the work. Physician, heal yourself is what Jesus is saying. Don't be hard on others. Be hard on yourself. And it's just, again, he's teaching us in this moment how to live and interact with other people. Are you going to be generous with yourself and hard on others? Or are you going to be hard on yourself and generous with others? The Christ follower looks at himself in the MRI first and does that work before they would ever do that to someone else. And then he gets to verse 6. He says, do not give the dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. He's talking about animals, but if you didn't know, he's not talking about animals. He's talking about people that act like animals which we all understand because haven't you been very animal-like in your life, right? So I know what it's like to be a dog and a pig, don't you? He's using imagery to help us understand that sometimes people act like dogs and pigs. He says, you don't give them what's sacred. You don't give pearls to pigs. If you do, they'll trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces too. You see, in Jesus' time, you didn't have a dog in your house to feed. Like, fresh pet does not work in ancient Israel, right? So you would never give to your animal something that was precious to you. You're having a hard time eating. You're not feeding it to your dogs. And to Jews, to hear about a pig, a pig was not sacred, not holy, right? And so it's, it's like you would never give something not sacred, not holy, something sacred, something precious, something important. He's talking about how we deal with people, that in our lives there's types of people And there might be a dog in your life, a pig in your life. Okay, what does that mean? See, I think what he's trying to do is compare and contrast. Our natural disposition is to be generous with ourselves and hard on others. And he says, not so with you, Christ follower. You're supposed to be generous with others and hard on yourself. But there's a danger of being so generous with others that you get trampled. He's counterbalancing our interaction. Right? And so I think what he's teaching us is this, that recognize that when your generosity is being trampled and lovingly walk away. That there's a time and a place 
to be hard on ourselves and generous with others, but not so far that you get trampled on, right? That there's a time not to give up on people. We don't give up on people, but sometimes we have to walk away from people. And that's wisdom, right? That's smart. That's God honoring. Because there's a way to live and to act that offends other people. There's a way as followers of Christ that we live and uh, breathe and think and act that makes people upset with us. And if we keep going there and keep being generous and keep being kind and get trampled on, he's going, wait, wait, wait. No, the follower of Christ is hard on themselves and generous with others, but not generous, so generous that you're unwise. You have the right kind of boundaries and the right kind of perspective that there's a time not to walk away and throw away a person, but there's time to wisely say, God, I entrust this person, this situation to you, and I'm not going to stay in this spot in the here and now. He's talking about in these first six verses how we interact with people, and then he gets to how we interact, how we're to interact with him, how do we interact with God. And so look at Matthew chapter seven, verse seven. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receive. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. I think he's getting at how do we interact with God. And he's inviting us to interact with God like children, like a child, right? So if a child wants a piece of candy, is anything going to deter them? If a child knows where to get a piece of candy, is anything? So, Mom, I want a piece of candy. No candy, and mom walks away. Is that going to stop a child? No. They seek after their mom, and they keep, mom, 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 candy, candy, candy. No, I'm not giving you candy. And mom goes into the bathroom and closes the door. She just needs her peace of mind for a moment. What does the child do? Knock, 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 knock. Mom, 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 mom. I know you have candy. I want candy. The child asks, the child seeks, the child knocks and doesn't stop until they get the attention of their parent. And God is saying, this is how you are to interact with me. You're to ask, you're to seek, you're to knock. Even when it doesn't seem like I'm answering, you're to keep coming to me with childlike faith, knowing that I can and will supply all your needs. And then he gets to verse 9 and says, which of you, if a son asks for bread, will give him a stone? He's talking about the character of God. If he asks for a fish, will give him a snake. If you, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven, who is not evil, he's good and perfect, Give good gifts to those who ask. He's talking about the character of God, that the character of God is he wants to give good gifts to his children. How? He wants us to ask. He wants us to seek. He wants us to knock. He wants us to keep coming, knowing he is the God who has all things and can provide all things to not be deterred when God seems to leave the room, to not be deterred when God seems like he's behind a door, to continue to ask, continue to knock, continue to seek, because if our good Father in heaven, if we know how to give good gifts to kids and our lives are messed up, what about our perfect Father in heaven who promises like the, to give good gifts to people? So here's what I learned by this. God gives good gifts to people, and he gives good gifts to his children. There's a lot of Gs in there. Wow, G, G, G. God gives gifts to people. He gives good gifts to his children. What do I mean by this? Well, to all people, to all God's creation, he gives the gift of, he, you are an be- image bearer, every person. He gives us life and breath and sun and rain and potential and possibility. He gives this to every single person on planet earth. He gives his son Jesus to live and to die and rise again and offer eternal life to all people. These are gifts that God the Father gives 
to all people, but he gives good gifts to his children. Because here's the deal. The way the Bible speaks, not everyone is a child of God. Actually, today, in our presence, not every one of you is a child of God. What does that mean? Like, we're all created by God. We're all created by God, but because of our sin, because of our shame, because we have rejected God, because there's been times we've walked away from God, we're called enemies of God. We're no longer friends of God. We're outside of God's love because of his general love is over all of us, but there's this way that because we rebel against God, he's like, you're now my enemy. You're against me right? And until we put our trust in Jesus, and when we put our trust in Jesus, he forgives us of our sins, and he makes us new and adopts us into his family. When we come to him and say, God, forgive me, what is God's answer? It's always, yes, I will forgive you, but what happens if someone never comes and asks or doesn't care to even see the fact that they're broken? Is God giving good gifts to that person? He's giving gifts to that person, but good gifts? He gives good gifts to his children who ask, who seek, who knock. He gives good gifts to them. What does that mean? He gives to his sons and daughters good gifts. Does that mean he's going to make you healthy, wealthy, and wise and make sure your candidate wins? Is that what he means? No, that's not what he means. What's he going to give? He's going to give peace. What good gift does he give his sons and daughters? The peace to navigate any situation. He's going to give you power, power to not judge. Power to be generous with other people. Power to not cast your pearls before swine. What else is he going to give? He's going to provide for you. Give us today our daily bread. Right? He's going to supply for your needs today. He's not going to spoil you and me. He's not a good father when we come to him and we ask him for things. And he knows, hey, you're asking for this and it's going to hurt you. So I'm not giving it to you. Because I'm going to provide what you need, not what you want. And he's going to provide protection. He's going to watch over you and me now and forevermore and walk with us no matter what the life circumstances. These are the good gifts that God promises to give his children when we ask them. Peace, power, protection, provision all the time until we see him face to face. It's what he promises. So what are we to do? We're to be sons and daughters of God that ask and to seek and knock And continue to say, God, I don't have peace, I don't have power, I don't have provision, I need protection, would you help me? Counting on the fact that he is going to respond because that is his nature. This is how we interact with God. And now when you get to the end of Matthew chapter 7, he's going to ask for a decision to be made. A decision. Look at what he says. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, And broad is the road to leads to destruction, and many enter through it, but small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Jesus knows that his teaching is going to cause a decision to be made by every person who hears him. He says, enter through a narrow gate, and he uses this beautiful little word picture. Look at this little picture he gives. He says, there's this broad way, and there's this narrow way. There's this broad highway that's straight, that everyone is on. That's the popular way, the cool way, the normal way, the culture way. And then there's the small one-lane country road. He's using this analogy to to get our attention to go, there's religion out there. There's self-focus, self-determination. There's religion, and it's a broad path. And everyone is on it. And where does it lead? It leads to destruction, he says. That that putting my hope in myself, putting my hope in religion, putting my hope in doing the right thing, that my good deeds would outweigh my bad deeds, that's religion and it leads to destruction. But there's a narrow way, a small way, a windy way, what seems more difficult, seems harder, it is harder. It's the way of Jesus, but where does it lead? It leads to life. And what's interesting about this is, as humans, we hear the teaching of Jesus and we go, Jesus, this is way too narrow. This this whole way of thinking is way too narrow. This is too exclusive. Like, there's got to be something in the middle, right? It can't be like all Jesus or nothing. That can't possibly be. There's got to be something else. Just in case you are tempted to think that way, he kind of doubles down in the next verse. Look what he says next. Watch out. 
for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. He's like, my, my way is narrow, and on this way there are going to be teachers, there's going to be preachers, there's going to be online people that are going to tell you there's a better way, a different way, a broad way. That Did God really say that? Did the Bible really teach that? No, there's new innovative ways to read the Bible, right? Like, no, the way they've read the Bible in the past, that's archaic. There's just no way. We are much more broad-minded. He's like, there's false teachers on the broad way. They're going to point to the narrow way and go, now there's a better way. Stay on this broad way. And it's ferocious wolves who are going to lead you astray because misery loves company. Misery loves company. And then he doubles down even more, just in case you're like, that's too exclusive. He says, not everyone who says to me, so there's false teachers. Now he's going to talk about false Christians. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. There's going to be people that say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do all this stuff, right? Like, He goes on to say in the rest of this verse, like, didn't I do these good things in your name? And Jesus says, away from me, I never knew you. Right, that there's people that that look the Christian part and act the religious part and they do the Christian and religious things, but they're not on the way because they're putting their hope in themselves and they're on the broad way that's leading to destruction. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I am a narrow way. And just in case, he kind of knows you and I are going to go, that seems too exclusive. There's just no way that could be. He finishes with yet another word picture. He says, therefore, decision time, everyone. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. He's going, the teaching that I'm giving you, I need you to make a decision about it. And he uses these word pictures he describes our lives like we're like houses in a, in, a, in a subdivision, right? You've driven through subdivision where all the houses look exactly the same, right? They have the same shutters, the same bad shrubs out front, the same color door, the same window, the same floor plan. Like, here's the subdivision, all the houses. And he's like, hey, all of these houses look all of the same from the outside. They're all baptized, catechized, Wesleyan, Presbyterian, fundamental, evangelical, uh, Lutheran, UCC. It all looks very Christian on the outside in the subdivision. All looks nice on the outside. And how will you know? Well, all of a sudden what looks on the outside looks great. A storm shows up. A storm shows up and one of the houses gets knocked down and one of the houses stand. See, because in life, Jesus knows, he's a realist, storms are going to show up. Financial storms, sexual storms, relational storms, political storms, financial storms. It's not if, when storms show up. What does your religion Do for you then, Jesus says. He's trying to help us make a decision to think about ourselves and our lives. And and what you do is when when a storm knocks down a house, you start to do a diagnosis of what, what what happened. Why did the house get knocked down? And when you start to diagnose how did the house get knocked down, you you look that that one of the houses was built on sand. It It was built on something insecure. It was, it was built on a popular way, a religious way, a self-determined way. It was built on something that was not firm, but then there was another house that had a basement. that They did the work to dig. They sweat a little bit. It took work. It took effort to dig, to build, to go down. 
And when you assess the storm shows up, how are you going to know in the subdivision which storm, which house is built on the rock? It's, it's the house that stands when the storm comes. And Jesus says about his house that's built, like he's the rock. He's the foundation. He's, he's the thing that you build on. And when you build your house upon the rock of Jesus Christ, when the storms come, because not it, whether if it will come, it will come. When it comes, what will happen to your Catholicism, to your fundamentalism, to your evangelicalism, to your Presbyterianism, to your religious good deeds? What will happen to your baptism and your catechism if your house is not built, if your heart is not built on Jesus Christ? It will come crashing down, Jesus says. And I love how theologian John Stott puts this. On our final destiny will be settled... Jesus insists in this passage, neither by what we are saying to him today. Our destination isn't about what we're saying to him today, nor by what we shall say to him on that last day, but whether we do what we say. That there's an integration, whether our verbal profession of faith is accompanied by our moral obedience, that there's something as a follower of Christ where you say, I believe in Jesus, and now I'm aligning my lifestyle, my actions, to a loyalty to him. That's what's sure. That's what's firm. That my heart and love for Christ is lined up. It's not just lip service. It's not just Broadway. It's not just I do Christian things. It's I've put my trust in Jesus. He's put his spirit in me. Now I align every aspect of my life to Jesus. So if you're a Christ follower today, this isn't about what you say. It's about what you do. It's not just having faith. It's having a faith that acts and starts to change who you are and how you behave sexually and financially and relationally and and how you see people and whether you judge them or not. It's all about putting our faith in action. And Jesus says that's the person that's going to stand the test when the storms come, because they're going to come. You know, I'm so glad that here at Faith Church, there are people that, and probably a vast majority of you, that have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But I'm so glad there are people here that are curious, that have just been searching and seeking. I'm so glad there's people here that are just admiring Jesus. And a lot, all this stuff that I just talked about, on one level, I'm not talking to you, but I would like to take a moment to talk to you If you're someone who has yet to put your trust in Jesus Christ for this life and the life to come, you've just kind of been checking it out, checking him out. Can I talk to you for a moment? If you're joining us online or here on campus, can I talk to you for a moment and remind you of Matthew chapter 7? Look at this picture again. Jesus says there's two roads. There's a religious road and there's a Jesus way. There's a destruction and a life. You pick. So if you're curious or you're wondering Like, you've gone and done the broad way. You have done the cultural things. You have followed the religious way. You've done your thing and done self-help and done self-governing. You've done all of that. Where has it led you? Have you experienced some destruction in your life? Some difficulty in your life that you thought it was going to do this, but it didn't deliver. You thought it was going to satisfy, but it didn't work. Have you done that before? Jesus is like, well, there's a different way. It's called the Jesus way, and it leads to life. He says, have you built your house on sand? Have you built your life on something that you thought was secure? Have you put your trust in yourself or religion, or you you tried to trust a person and they let you down? You tried to trust a political system and it let you down? You tried to trust in money? You tried to trust in work? But all of it just crumbled underneath you. He says, do you you want to put your trust in something that will be firm when the storms come? He says, put your trust in Jesus. And you know what the work of building this basement is? You know what the work of building it is? The Bible says the work is to believe. To believe in God. To believe that you're broken. To believe that you're lost. To believe that you need help to believe that Jesus lived and died and rose again, to believe that he will rescue you now and forever, to believe the work of God is to believe that God has what you need and all you have to do is be honest with him and come to him and believe. Man, is today the day that you move from death to life, from destruction and sand to 
Jesus and life? Is that you today? Maybe I'm talking to you to make a choice, a decision that says, I've tried that and it doesn't work, but I want to try Jesus. Can I pray with you? God, thank you for each person here. You know the people that are joining me online, joining us in campus, in the chapel here. And I want to talk specifically to the person who's been curious, the person that's been admiring, the person that has tried religion, the person that has tried satisfaction in other things, but today they recognize that everything they've done is leading to destruction and not peace. It's self-governing and doesn't work. And I want to ask you today, if that's you, to put your trust in Jesus. And you don't have to say a magic prayer. You just have to be honest with Jesus. He sees and knows your heart. And so, like, if you've never put your trust in Jesus, do that. You can do that today, right? Again, no magic prayer. It's just saying, Jesus, I'm sorry. It's saying, Jesus, forgive me. It's saying, Jesus, I believe in you that you died and rose again. I trust you, Jesus, for this life and the life to come. Today, you can make a decision to put your hope and trust in Jesus Christ for the very first time. And so if that's you, can I ask you to do something bold? If I'm talking to you today, can I ask you to stand up? Nobody else is looking. Can I ask you just to stand where you are? Because I want to pray specifically for you. I want to ask God to bless you and watch over you because you have yet to put your full weight and trust in Jesus Christ. But today, you would like to do that. Again, no magic words, but you want to say before God, I'm ready to put my full weight on you, Jesus. God, you see and know every heart. And some people, you know they're shy and they don't want to stand, but you know inside their heart they're standing. And if they're joining me online, they might be standing in a bedroom by themselves or pulled over on the side of the road on a car because they want to put their trust and hope in you and you alone. So you see them and you know them and you made them and you care about them. And you know the sand of their lives and the destruction of their lives and you sent your son to rescue these people, to rescue us. So I pray that you would help these people to put their full weight on you, to trust you, to not be afraid, to have hope. I pray that they would welcome you into their finances, into their sexuality, into their relationships, into their politics, I pray that they would welcome you into their finances and every aspect of their lives because with you is fullness of joy. With you is fullness of joy. And so I pray, too, that they would let someone know that they've made this decision because following you is not something we're supposed to do alone. And so thank you, guys. You can be seated. God, I pray that you'd watch over this church family and may we be the sons and daughters that are committed to you that all of us would choose to honor you and follow you and trust you. That we would be hard on ourselves and generous with others. That we would be wise. That we would come to you like children. That we would follow you and keep asking. And we would trust that you're going to protect us and provide for us. You can do this in us. We trust you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.